Yeah, I'm really excited as we study through Colossians. Colossians is a book in the Bible that it was written for a specific purpose. Uh, it was a church, as we discussed last time, Colossae was not a place where Paul started the church. Uh, instead, one of his disciples went to Colossae to start the church. So why would Paul write a letter to this church? Well, I think we're going to discover part of the reason today. Uh, last time we talked about a Thanksgiving prayer, and we talked about how God uh, was thanked by Paul for these people in Colossae, and, and for the saints that were there, for the people who believed in Jesus that was there. And, you know, I thank God for you. I hope that we thank God for each other. Amen? What would this community be like? What would this country be like? What ultimately would this world be like without Christians? I really believe that when the rapture comes, we're going to enter right into the seven years of tribulation because you take the presence of God's people out of this world, it's going to make a tremendous impact. I truly believe that. Uh, so uh, I don't know what your theory of rev revelation or, or end times is, but I, I really believe that that could well uh, precipitate the beginning of the seven years of tribulation when the Christians are called home by Jesus. So I'm looking forward to that time. But he's left us here for a reason in the meantime. Amen? Uh, and we need to thank God for each other. What would life be without other Christians to believe in, to trust in, uh, to be able to go talk to, to, to have support us, and, and to be able to support them? What would the world be like without other Christians? So I, I, I agree with Paul. I thank my God in every remembrance of you. Uh, understanding your faith in Christ and your commitment to the brethren, to the, the brotherly love. Uh, but today we're going to look at the real issue. Paul was writing this letter to Colossae because there were some folks who crept in. There were some people who had some different thoughts and different ideas about who Christ was, about how central Christ was to belief and to faith. And I want to talk to you today about the centrality of Christ uh, as we think about this. That picture up there is a, still a road sign that <laughs> points to Colossae, but unfortunately Colossae is just right there, that hill. <laughs> uh, it's not much of a city anymore. We looked at some pictures last week about that. I, uh, you know, it's still a question in our minds about who Christ is, isn't it? I got a, a, an email last night from one of our younger ch church members, Miss Savannah. Uh, and uh, on behalf, her mom sent me the email on behalf of Savannah. Savannah was asking a question about Christ, about who Christ was. Said uh, her question as she studies the book of John. Uh, isn't it cool that that young lady studying the book of the Bible? <laughs> uh, but as she studies the book of John, she found the place where Christ was praying to his father. And she wondered, well, why or how could they be one if, if one was praying to the other. And, and so uh, I answered her back with some scriptures and helped her to see John is the, the greatest book in the Bible for declaring uh, how Christ and God are one. Amen? The Trinity of, of, of God. I, I was going to refer to my sermon, but for some reason the sermon for that week is not on the, <laughs> not on the, uh, on the Trinity of, of, of God. It's not on the um, um, website. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, I'd like for us to discuss the centrality of Christ uh, today. As I shared with Savannah, that young girl with all those serious questions, we should all have a good idea of who Christ is too. Amen? Because when you, when you dilute or when you change the biblical view of Christ, you get into all kinds of heresy all kinds of difficulty. You either see Christ as the Bible presents him in all of his glory, or you understand a lesser Christ, and a lesser Christ is not able uh, to give us hope and a future. We have to understand the biblical Christ so we can understand the hope and the future that we have. Uh, I want to share with you, uh, as we start this morning, Colossians 1, 15 through 23. If you would turn there in your Bibles, Colossians 1. I, I'm going to actually begin in verse 13, if you would. Uh, we, we talked about giving thanks to the Father in verse 12, who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints 
in light. Isn't that cool? That God has qualified us to share with the inheritance of the saints of light. Uh, then in verse 13, if you would stand in honor of God's word as we read it together. Verse 13. For he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. For it was a father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven, and although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach, if indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister." Father, we pray that you would open our hearts to understand your scripture, that the Holy Spirit would interpret for us what you're trying to say to each of us individually. Lord, I know that uh, any time we read your scripture, that you can help us to understand. You can help us to see how it applies. You can help us individually to have our lives changed because you have spoken to us. And I pray, Lord, that would be the result of our time in your word today. That we would understand your son Jesus better than we ever have. And we would see just what a, a glorious, wonderful Savior that we serve and love. And what a wonderful God, Lord, three in one, that we believe in here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The first thing I want to share with you is that the scriptures proclaim that Christ is central to our faith. Now, I, I've listed some scriptures up there uh, on, on, the, uh, uh, on the screen. Now, it is certainly not an exhaustive list. Certainly, there are a lot more scriptures that we could put up there on the screen. But these are some that help us to understand how Christ is central, how Christ is biblically central to our faith, to our belief, uh, to everything, uh, even to creation itself. In Luke 22, 70, when Jesus is before the Sanhedrin, the scripture says, And they all said, Are you the Son of God then? And he said, Yes, I am. And they said, What further need we have we of testimony? For we have heard it ourselves with our own mouth that Jesus was claiming to be God. In John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In John 1.14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. Uh, so John identifies that in, in the beginning, from the beginning, that Jesus has always existed, and that later on he says he helped create, as Colossians also said, uh, that he created the world, uh, a title we often give to God as our creator. Uh, and then it says the word also became human. It became flesh, and we beheld his glory. In John five eighteen. for this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but was also calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Making himself equal with God. Jesus said to them in John 8, 58, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, you remember what it says? I am Yahweh. He claimed the title of God. And Abraham preceded him by thousands of years or hundreds of years. And yet he says, before Abraham was born, I already was there. I am 
Uh, then he goes on to say in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. In John 14, 7, Jesus says, If you had known me, you would have known my Father. From now on, you both know him and have seen him. Isn't that an interesting statement? In John 20, 28, when Thomas, who had doubted the resurrection of Jesus, beheld Jesus, didn't have to put his hands in his side or, or his fingers into the scars in his hands. When he saw the resurrected Jesus, he said, my Lord, isn't it interesting? And my God. My Lord and my God. One and one with Jesus and God. So those are all from the book of John. Uh, certainly the, the book that Savannah is studying. I shared those scriptures with her in that email because uh, that's a book that very conclusively lets us know who Jesus is. In Matthew 16, verse 15, Jesus asked Peter, Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, well, Peter had a pretty good idea of who Jesus was. Paul says in Romans 1, 4, uh, Jesus, who was declared the Son of God through power by resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. And in this book of Colossians, a couple of verses, Colossians 1, 18, that we read a few minutes ago, he is also the head of the body of the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. And in Colossians 2.9, Paul says of Jesus, For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. We're going to be unpacking that a little bit more to understand who our Lord and, and, and Savior is. It, it is not only true that these apostles and these missionaries of God uh, believed in Jesus and believed in his uh, standing with God the Father and his identification with God. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen God. But also the early church believed in the centrality of Christ. The early church believed that Jesus was God. Ignatius wrote that Jesus said of himself uh, that he was God himself manifest in human form. In uh, 150, that was back in 105, in 150 A.D., uh, Clement of Alexandria said, it is fitting that you should think of Jesus Christ as of God. When you think of Jesus Christ, you think of God. And then in 200 AD, Tertullian wrote, Christ our God. Uh, so you see the early church, and finally in 235, Novation said, He is not only man, but God also. So the early church identified Jesus with God. You, you have to understand that Jesus is not just central in the New Testament. He is central in the Old Testament as well. Uh, with the early scriptures that they investigated to find out the truths of Christ were the Old Testament scriptures. We're going to study that in our life group in a few minutes. They were the Old Testament scriptures. That was the scriptures that the early church had. And they said the scripture pointed to who Christ was. And then as the New Testament was written, it reaffirmed the centrality of Christ. Uh, Christ is central in his person. When you think about it, who he is makes him central in our thoughts and in our theology. He is the very image and manifestation of God, of the true invisible God. If we look there in verse 15, it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He's the image of God. It's interesting that Greek word is a word icon. Uh, it's E-I-C-O-N instead of our I-C-O-N. Uh, it's icon. It, it means a, a, a exact representation. It means an exact copy. And really what, what Paul is saying here is that Christ is the exact copy of God. He is the exact representation of God. Uh, that when you see Christ, as Christ said, you see the Father. Uh, he is the exact representation of the true and visible God. Uh, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So we understand that, that when you looked at Christ, and you know, sometimes we get so caught up in physical form, don't we? You know, we think of people as, as Kenny, would you step up here? <laughs> 
for just a moment? No, no, he said, no, I'm not going to. 